couple years ago, I was in Tokyo protesting. They wanted to see why I could use my feet the way I could. And they found out that the little part of your brain that runs your foot coordination on the average person is the size of a pea. And mine's like the size of a baseball. My brain, it's like, well, you don't have hands, so let's just use that part of your brain that would store your, how to use your hands for stuff. Let's just make that into your feet. It's amazing how your body grows with, you know, like if it needs your feet, it takes over that part of the brain and makes it anyway, to store the information. But Hi, I'm Chris Whiteout. Welcome to Living It, the podcast where we join experts in the experience of being human. Be bold. Say yes to adventure. Say yes to living it. Welcome to Chris Waddell Living It, the podcast, where I talk with experts in the experience of being human. You guys are in for a huge treat today with Matt Stutzman. Matt is a silver medalist in the Paralympics. He holds a world record for the longest accurate shot with a bow and arrow. Can I call it a bow and arrow? The longest archery shot, 310 yards. We're going to have to get into that because I don't even think you can see that. That's almost three football fields. He is a race car driver. He just recently uh, qualified for the 2021 Paralympics in Tokyo while breaking another world record. So Matt, you you are on a high. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. And yes, I feel amazing about it. This is really cool. So So looking at what you did at trials, can you tell us a little bit of what that means? So you shot like a 700 and and is that 700 out of 720? Is it 700 out of 700? Uh, Because archery, a lot of people know archery from like summer camp. They don't know what you do. How did this all work? Yeah, so we're shooting at a target that's 50 meters away. So it's about 55 yards away. The bullseye, I would say, is smaller than a CD that you would stick in a in your radio. Like it's pretty small and at that distance, right? So in the in the archery world, 700, uh, for example, let's say the middle's the bullseye is 10, and then it goes the scoring rings are nine, eight, so forth. A 700 is like you're the man <laughs> and that's out of 720 right hold so on, hold on. Rec- you're the our man world re- <laughs> our world records uh like 705 right and, and so like no one has ever shot over 705 points so even in like normal archery tournaments if you shoot a 700 like you are like the very next day they did uh uh able-bodied socal showdown and the guy who qualified first shot like a 705 or whatever and that's able-bodied too so like if you're shooting 700s you you got to figure it out so you broke the paralympic record where but but you said that the 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 highest score ever was 705 and that's able-bodied or disabled no that's the pair the pair record is 705 yeah Okay, but what did you break? So uh, I broke the double 72 uh, score. So uh, on day one, we shot 72 arrows. And on day two, we shot 72 arrows. And they called that like an event. And they paired them together. Um, And no, I shot a, so a 1,398. So almost a 1,400. Yeah, which is which is back. In fact, I was aiming for the 1400 because if you get the 1400, you I mean, that's basically like perfect scoring in in archery world kind of. So you were you were ready like you you are hot. You're on top of your game right now. Yeah, you know, actually, believe it or not, um, having the year uh, with everything that went on with COVID and stuff helped me redo everything that I thought, you know, like with the archery process and my mental game, it, you know, it was like a, a blessing to have this whole year for extra training and resetting my brain and, and making sure I was, you know, hundred percent ready. So we've got to go through a couple of other things just because one, I think you've got to describe to people how you actually shoot. Cause I introduced you as the armless archer. And, and if people are listening to this, they probably don't have an idea <laughs> of how this is working unless they've gone to YouTube and they've checked you out. So how do, how do you go about shooting? 
<laughs> real quick uh a lot of people are like what do you do and i'm like i'm an archer and then like one lady she was like and i'm a wrestler like nobody believes nobody believes in me when i say i'm an archer so i i usually have to explain how i shoot a lot <clears throat> so before i tell you how i do that everything on my bow that i shoot is not modified whatsoever so I have learned to figure out how to shoot a bow that is made for everyone, right? Like it's not a specific bow or anything like that. So what I do is I, I balance the bow, uh, it sits on the ground between my legs. I use my right foot to grab the arrows off the ground. I load the bow with it. And you have amazing dexterity in your feet. I mean, this is, this is mind blowing really because because you you use your feet as well as somebody uses their hands like i saw you in your race car and you're you're like adjusting knobs uh -huh. with your feet and in my mind I went, oh so hold on where, where did he get hands you know but, <laughs> but you don't so so you have the dexterity to grab the 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 arrow yeah yeah a couple years ago i was in tokyo for testing they wanted to see why i could use my feet the way i could and they found out that the little the little part of your brain that runs your foot coordination on the average person's the size of a pea and mine's like the size of a baseball my my brain it's like well you don't have hands so let's just use that part of your brain that would store your how to use your hands for stuff let's just make that into your feet stuff so my you know it's amazing how your body grows with, you know, like if it needs your feet, it takes over that part of the brain and makes it anyway, to store the information. But no, this is awesome. I love it. Okay. So you're sitting on the ground. You've got the, got the bow between your legs. You're, you grab the arrow with your foot. And then what happens there? This, this is where yoga practice comes in. So at this point, I will grab my bow with my right foot and I will, what I call gentlemen, uh, cross my legs, right? Like a, and like a, triangle which brings my right foot up closer to my chest mm -hmm. at this point i bend down and this is this is a, a little modification i have but it's not with the bow but it's a strap that i wear around my chest and on my right shoulder there's a little uh, release aid device that i've designed and i will actually hook it onto the bow then i sit up and i push my chest or my my foot away from my chest which draws the bow and once i'm at full draw aiming then I, um, the release hit on my right shoulder has a trigger on my chin. And then I put that right there and I slowly start applying pressure until the shot goes, hopefully shooting a 10 every time. <laughs> what makes someone a good archer? Like, I mean, is, is this the vision to be able to, to get the bullseye? Is it being steady? What goes into being, to being a good archer? Uh, I think it's, I think it's mental to be honest with you, the mental toughness, because I can teach anybody how to shoot a bow. I can teach you how to shoot a bow, even though I have no arms. I can still teach you how to shoot a bow where you would hit a target at 20 yards within an hour. But getting the mindset of someone who's actually going to hit a bullseye at 50 meters away every time, that's all mental. My mental game this trials was better than it's ever been in any of my shoots ever in the last 10 years why is that because i i don't know like i found out what it takes to win um every shot counts and you have to make every shot perfect you don't get a redo and for something for some reason during this quarantine moment i when i was in practice something just clicked in my brain and it, and it just said, look, if it's not right, don't shoot it. And I shot, you know, 300, almost 400 arrows for score. And every single one of them I made when I was ready and knew it was right. And, I, and that's a mental thing that just all of a sudden started clicking with me for some reason. I noticed that my opponents kept watching my scores. And I, and I told Jessica, I said, because she was with me, and I told her, it's like, they're not, they're not going to beat me now. They were so worried about what I was doing that they weren't worrying about focusing on themselves. And I only focused on what I was doing. Mental. It's all mental. That tunnel vision is really hard, though, isn't it? Just to, to say this is and, and obviously you're talking about 
you were practicing the tunnel vision. So each mm-hmm. time, each time you get up there, if it didn't feel right, you backed away because mm-hmm. the practice, the muscle memory, the mental memory of mm-hmm. seeing of seeing that hit the bullseye was what you needed to have needed to practice as much as anything. I think that people don't understand just how just how emotionally and mentally taxing archery <laughs> is, right? So it's not just like a bunch of you hanging out on a line just shooting shooting at your target, right? I mean, this is this is head to head, isn't it? Mhm. Yeah, so like for example, on the last day we shot 72 arrows for score in the morning. Then we took a 2-hour break. Then we shot another 100 and whatever arrows against each other all afternoon and you have like I was tired I I went back to the hotel I was like I'm done like my (laughs) it's a lot of work mentally for sure now is it because it's I mean there's some events right where it's your opponent shoots one arrow Mm -hmm. and you shoot one arrow Mm -hmm. then they shoot one arrow and so it's like you're not really it's like you're having to establish your rhythm every every time you don't just sit Mm -hmm. there and go okay i shoot one then okay now i'm Mm -hmm. feeling it it's like it breaks your rhythm right and and emotionally you're looking at him going okay he just shot this it what does that do to you when you're head to head with somebody it it wears you out (laughs) really fast so you are absolutely correct um at the games they will alternate back and forth right and not only will they alternate back and forth, for as much as you don't want to know what your opponent is shooting, the announcer will let you know. <laughs> so, so, so like, here's a great example, right? So it, just to tell you how you have to be mental, because I've seen this happen so many times. Let's say I need a, a t- if I sh- my opponent's already shot and I have one arrow left. If I hit a 10, I win, he goes home. If I hit a nine, we tie. We have to shoot a one arrow shoot off. If I shoot an eight, I go home. And you'll hear the announcer say that because he's trying to describe to the audience the drama that's about to unfold. So now almost every archer I've seen has done this before, including myself. As soon as you hear that, your brain starts freaking out. Don't shoot an eight. Don't shoot an eight. You're going to go home if you shoot an eight. Don't shoot an eight. And almost every single time you will shoot an eight. (laughs) so you have to have that mental toughness to be like i'm gonna shoot a 10 i'm gonna send this guy home like almost like like watch this dudes like bye see you later man nice knowing you i'm gonna shoot this 10 like you have to have that kind of confidence otherwise (laughs) otherwise you're shooting eights and you're the one going home are you practicing this are you sitting there at your range going okay this is it a 10 to win nine Mm -hmm. to tie eight to go home and mm-hmm. and and are you going okay this is it like let's focus mm-hmm. and how does that work i spent more time in this last year practicing that than i did even process or anything else because i already have that figured out so um i shoot with jessica a lot and and she and who is jessica uh she's my girlfriend okay um we've been dating probably two maybe two years or more but she's into archery as well and so we shoot together she's at the beginner stages of archery she just is now getting to 50 meters but i'll just be like you know i'll I'll give her a handicap score or something like that right so the other day she was shooting and she shot a 10 and she's like you know which is amazing right so i immediately in my brain went okay on my next shot i'm gonna pretend like that's our one arrow shoot off and i shot against that one shot and she beat me I still shot a 10, but her 10 was closer, but she didn't, she had no idea that I was competing against her. Right. But that's just ways I would use to mentally train myself because I know in Tokyo, it's going to be like that. So this wasn't for who had to do the dishes or those kinds of things. <laughs> no, I should, I should, I should have put a little pressure on her, but, uh, it, <laughs> no, um, it's interesting. I read an article last year about, about chess players. And this totally blew me away because it was talking about the amount of calories that chess players burn. It was like, 
it was like 10,000 calories. A, yeah, I mean, it was something, it was something absolutely incomprehensibly insane because you're thinking, well, they're just sitting there. They're just sitting there. I mean, it's not like that hard to move mm -hmm. a piece or whatever, but it was the mental energy, the grinding over each, the, the significance of each move and, and all of these things. And it sounds like in a lot of ways, that's, that's where you are as an archer too. I mean, you've got the physical component of it, mm -hmm. but, but do you think that's fair that, that it's the mental, that, that it's the mental fatigue more than anything? Plus this is an all day event, right? Yeah, no, I, look, I think mental is the most valuable part of going to the games and not going to the games. Um, every shot, you have to make a decision based on the wind. Right. So you have to have that mental toughness over and over and over and over again. Um, I feel it's very much like chess. You're you're playing a game and it's and it's all in your head. It's all your brain telling you where you think you should aim and how you're judging things. And if you made a good shot and if you executed well. So for me, I actually talk to myself while I'm shooting now because I have a process. So as I'm drawing the bow in my head, I'm like, okay, foot's in the right position. All right, set my shoulder, bring my face down, apply pressure on the bar. Okay, hold my breath. And okay, aim in the middle. Now apply pressure, apply pressure, slowly, slowly. Like I have to do that. And if you miss a step, like <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly like doing really, really well. And I'm, I'm starting to go to full draw. And my mind was like, I wonder what I'm gonna eat for supper. And that arrow, I shot a nine. And I'm like, oh, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> Is there actually yoga in your life? I mean, you're talking about the yoga of, of pulling, your, pulling your leg up, which, I mean, to watch you drive, to watch you shoot, you've got some crazy flexibility in your leg. I mean, it's, uh, you use it, so you probably don't even notice it. But Yoga, there's there's the flexibility part of it, but then there's also the the mental focus meditation mm -hmm. component of it. Do you actually do yoga? I I don't do yoga. I I say I do yoga uh, as a joke, um, <laughs> but every day is yoga for me because uh, if I just want to eat, I gotta use my foot to bring your food to my face, so I'm flexible. Like I I you know brushing my teeth or what you know anything is always with my legs up and and around and stuff like that. Um, so I call that my daily yoga. Are they both equally flexible? So you use your right leg most of the time. Is your left leg as flexible as your right leg? Not as flexible, but it's still it's still pretty good. I I can put my right leg behind my head still, <laughs> which is my left leg not not so much. But it is interesting because uh, I can write my name in cursive with both feet. Yeah. That so. is awesome. Well, you kind of have to, right? I mean, you don't have much of a choice. It's either your feet or your or your mouth. Those are your right. Yeah. right, right? That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so you've qualified for the games. What are the next steps? Because it's what, uh, August 25th, I think, is the opening ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't have nothing going on until like August 9th. Um, we will go to California and we will kind of go into quarantine, um, at the Olympic training center there in Chula Vista. I don't even know if they call it, it's the elite training center now, I think. Right. Um, uh, but I will stay there from the ninth until we go to the games there and I'll be able to practice as much as I can get it out of my heart and soul. So how do you stay sharp? I mean, obviously you're sharp right now. Yeah, so what I feel works best for me, uh, some people don't agree with, but it, it works. So because it's such a mental taxing of the brain, I won't shoot for the next probably three weeks. Really? Yeah. And you I know that rusty? sounds, I know that, I know, you know, well, you would think so, but no. Um, I remember this is a this is when I learned this about myself. I remember shooting the one of the largest tournaments in the world, payout wise, the Vegas, the Vegas shoot. If you shoot a nine hundred, uh, you can like the payouts are insane, like one hundred twenty grand. A nine hundred is a perfect score. Well, I keep shooting eight ninety nines 
right? So like, I'm like right there, but why can't I, why can't I just get that hurdle? Right. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I was so frustrated that I just, I didn't shoot for like a month, went to my next tournament and shot clean. Shot clean means that you had tens on every I didn't shot. Miss, I, did, I didn't miss any points. Yeah. I was the, fir- I was the first person with a physical disability to shoot a perfect score. First person ever. In fact, I and this was an able-bodied competition, and I was one of seven in the whole world to do it. Wow! There was only there was only six. There was, sorry, I was the seventh. So there was only six people at that tournament, and these are the best in the world. There's only six other people that did it, and that's why I was like, okay, my brain just needs a reset. Sometimes I think it. I think it's good. It's good to just be like, okay, I, I know everything. I've shot it so much that it's fine. And if I know my next tournament isn't for until like two months from now, I can afford to take off a month and just let my brain just not think about yellow and, and dots and wind. And because a couple of years ago for the Rio games, I spent the whole entire year shooting every single day. And when I got there, like I was, I was drained when I got there. You know, like I put in the time because I wanted to outwork everyone and, and then the results weren't that good. Right. I just was too much pressure on myself, too much. I just drained myself. So that's when I learned about, hey, it's OK to take a month and just let your brain like go into la la land for a little bit because of how taxing it is. Wow. Now that so you are so you're not thinking about it at all. I mean, you're not I don't think about like, it at all. I, I'm no still doing imagery. exercises. Yeah, well, I'm still doing exercises physically. Right. Like I'm still I'm still doing that stuff. But it, if I were to shoot a bow, I literally would be at a target that's like five feet away with no target on it whatsoever. So it literally doesn't matter. And and that's and that's what works for you. That's what works for me. But it's yeah. an interesting question too, isn't it? Because sometimes <clears throat> it's almost like our our sense of insecurity, we need to feel like we're working as hard as we can possibly work, which oftentimes mm-hmm. when we're doing that, we're working against mm-hmm. ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that whole idea of like, like looking at like the, the, uh, the sprinters in, in the hundred meters in the Olympics. And, and when they slow it down, like their face is so loose that it's like bouncing <laughs> up and down. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is like, Oftentimes we're thinking, oh, you gotta, you know, like grimace, and you've got to like tighten every single muscle and and you know squeeze every drop of energy out of it in order. But this is what works for you to be able to say, I have the muscle memory, mm-hmm. and and the important part because I'd imagine. I mean, you're talking about the mental part of it that gets to be so challenging with with like this is the way the wind is going, and that's and and I would imagine that at some point you kind of get almost backwards Mm -hmm. where you've been thinking about it so much and it's like the wind is coming this way and it's like oh instead of shooting into the wind i shot with the wind and it was worse yeah you can overthink it yeah you can overthink it have you when you were younger or even now do you ever play uh xbox or like old school nintendo you ever play like you know uh super mario and on the old nintendos and things like that before Oh yeah. Have you ever got you ever got to a world where you like spent hours trying to get it and you're like, oh, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, and you get it right away. That that's hap- that's happened to me too, where you, you're trying so hard to get it and you and you spend hours and you fail, 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 fail. And then you're just like, okay, mom says time to go to bed. So you go to bed. The next morning you wake up, bam, you beat the whole level in one try, just like that. I think it's just because your brain needs a reset. Like it just is like, hey man, take a nap. <laughs> you know, you're over trying, you're overthinking it. I, I I feel like that's kind of like the best example I could relate it to supposedly. W- was it hard to give yourself that permission to say I'm taking a month <laughs> off? You know because it's like w- this is what you do. I'm taking a month off right before the most important thing. Was it hard to give yourself that permission? Oh yeah, you have no idea cuz I I have a motto that no one trains harder than me, right? Which means right now my competitors are probably shooting their bows every single day and trying to get themselves better. So it's really hard for me not to want to go out and sit in a chair and just practice and practice and practice and practice. But 
I know where I know where my body is with my bow and I know what needs to be worked on. And for me, that's the mental side. And my mental game needs a break. Like it's it's healthy to have a break. That is so cool. Now I noticed I, I've, I've been stalking you on Facebook. I apologize, mm-hmm. but it, it looks like you're you're bringing sexy back into into archery as well. <laughs> when I was in Rio, I weighed like 220 pounds, and I've always been the guy who would kind of be like, "I'm a, I'm just an archer. I don't need to be healthy, right? Like I'm just an archer." Well, in 2016, I had a conversation with Michael Johnson. Um, and he told me, he said, Hey, if you, cause we were, we, we went down to Texas to his center and we were working on how to get 1% better. So this is how Michael Johnson, high? the sprinter, 200 and 400 meter guy, Correct. the, gold shoes the, the golden yeah. shoes. Yeah. And he goes, Matt, if you really want, if you, you, you say you're, you're you want to be the best athlete in the world, or you want to be the best archer in the world, right? Then you, you got, you got to play the whole part. You can't just take it. There's no shortcuts. You, you got to be the athlete. Like if you want to be 1% better, you got to play. You can't just be the guy who is a good archer that can do whatever he wants and be 220 pounds. Like if you want to be the best, you also have. Anyway, um, so after my loss in Rio, I was like, all right, maybe this guy's on to something. So um, I started working hard and uh, working in the gym and putting all of it together. And I had a targeted weight of where I wanted to be. I found out that I shoot my best at 165 pounds for some reason. Like I just. How'd you figure that out? Um, Cause at one point, like a year or so ago, I actually got down to 155 pounds and I, and, and as I would like, my shooting got worse and worse. And even though I, even though I felt amazing, my shooting wasn't that good. And I don't know if it's because I just didn't have the muscle anymore for it or whatever. So then I redid my my game plan and then started going with muscle. So now 165 at the at the percentage of body fat that I am right now, that's when I started winning everything. And I'm like, okay, well, that's where I need to be. So I've been maintaining that for several years now and it's it's paid off. So you said you were going to the gym. What were you doing? Were you doing, I mean, was this endurance stuff? What, you know, cardio? Are you doing explosive <laughs> stuff? Are you? I did a lot of arms. <laughs> I, did a lot, I did a lot of arm stuff. My, my gym shirt, I still wear every time I go to the gym, says every day is arm day. And it has like this arm emoji <laughs> on it. And everybody's like, what? Anyway, um, <laughs> when I was first doing it, it was just to lose weight. And uh, so now it's like um, heavy weights, slow, uh, nothing explosive because I'm not trying to trigger my twitch muscles. The, the object is to get, cause I use the bigger muscles of my body to shoot, right. not the fast twitching one. So that's kind of what I focus on. Because you really want everything to be slow and steady and, mm-hmm. and balanced, Pre- right? You and balance, precise. Process. Like fewer yeah. moving parts makes for a better shot. I'm assuming. Correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. So 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 slow movement, but this is where I mean, because that's that's dropping almost sixty pounds. That's a yeah. that's a lot of weight. It is a lot of weight. Yeah. You change your diet too. Every yeah, all all everything. Um. I do a lot of uh, protein shakes and stuff like that. Um, I've been working with a company since 2017 and I do lots of shakes for like breakfast and lunch. And and we know what my protein numbers are as far as where I'm trying to be at every single day. Um, I was able to, with their help, I was able to go all the way down to 150 pounds and then go up and down and just try to find like we were able to hit all the numbers if I wanted to go up if I wanted to go down until we found the perfect number that I felt my best at are your competitors doing this no Mm -mm. if you look at the pictures of my competitors uh which is funny but they all think like I thought back in 2016 so a lot of them have gained a lot of weight you know 
So, which is, I'm not saying that that makes them a bad archer. What I'm saying is, is I've been there before. I know what, I know that feeling of, I just need to sit, sit and shoot and shoot and shoot. Cause that's, what's going to make me better. But in, when I did that, I just got heavy because you didn't do anything. You just ate a bunch of food and then you sat and shot all day. Um, my mindset though, is I just want to be the best in the world, right? I don't want to be just the best Paralympic archer. Like I want to go on to any stage. I want to shoot the 900 of Vegas. You know, like I want, I want to win that tournament and, and that's where my goals are at. And, and so is there, is there an Olympic uh, kind of step for you or is it Paralympic and then sort of what sounds like a more open kind of uh, competition? I do, I do have a goal. Um, the men's able-bodied compound team. They are the best in the world. They Every year they travel around the world shooting um, a circuit against all the best archers from other countries. Um, it's like, kind of like an Olympics, but it's a, it's a um, like you get the, the best three archers from each country that show up uh, and they all shoot this like five, five tournament circuit. And, you know, you can win, you know, they, they are legit the best archers in the world in the compound division. So that's my goal is to make that team. I tried out for the men's team in 2017 and I actually made the team. <laughs> I, I made the able body team and it was like this most crazy experience in the, like ever. And I was like, this is amazing. And then the next year I tried back out for the Paris cause we had world championships and had earned slots and all this other kind of stuff. So eventually my goal would be to move to that level of, of, of competition. So it's almost like a barnstorming kind of competition where you're traveling around and and just picking mm -hmm. up the best the best archers wherever you go and yep. having this competition. Do you yeah. get a lot of people who are watching those kinds of events or what's the what's the audience like? Yeah, no, I mean the whole in archery world that is the highest level of of compound competition ever. That is like that it's that's the summit right there. Now, in listening to your approach, your training, your your physical fitness, it looks like you've it looks like you've you've created some some objectives or some priorities in terms of what's going to get you better. What have you signaled in terms of like these are the things that I need to work on in order to be the best in the world. And if you put that out there as a goal, that's a pretty big goal. You've got to beat everybody in the world. Yeah. So when I, when I think about what my goals are to be the best in the world, they're not necessarily just to win everything. I also want to make the sport better than what it is. Right. So when I set these goals, um, I wanted to be healthy, right. I wanted to, uh, um, be in shape. I want to feel good about my body and where I was at. I also wanted to perform at a high level. Uh, I want to, I want to set small records. Like I, in Tokyo, I want to break the, the Paralympic record there on site, you know, and so I have all these goals, but I know what it takes to get there. So my goal is one arrow at a time. And I know if I do one arrow at a time and do what I did in trials, I'm going to get the record. Second of all, especially this last year to, um, there is, I'll just give you a little, little awesome little news. We find out later this month if there's going to be a, other armless archers in Tokyo. Oh. Yeah. So we are working with two other people who have shot scores that are pretty good that have no arms. So this could potentially be the first games in the history of, of the world that would have two or, th or three armless archers shooting at the same event. That, so that in my mind, like, that's what you're working towards, right? You're trying to work towards making the sport better. You're trying to like, you know, Michael Phelps is known as, you know, the greatest swimmer ever. And I don't think it's just because of his amazing ability. Like he changed the sport for the better. And so that's kind of like where my goal was set as well. When I say I wanted to become the best archer in the world. Yeah. And so when you were talking what I was thinking and you were saying one, one arrow at a time, it really is that focus. Just, just having that single-minded focus and just blocking everything else out, which has to be euphoric when you do it. 
it's a weird feeling okay so if you were to go look if you were to look at a video of me shooting right especially at trials and i, I don't <laughs> and i was watching i was watching there's a shot i make that i don't remember and i i smoke i smoke it it's like <laughs> behind me there was distractions going on there was people talking like loud you could hear them all talking and there's cameras going on and i don't remember any of that like i must have just been in a bubble because once i drew that bow back i forgot about everything like i didn't hear anything i i don't even remember the smell i don't i don't, <laughs> I don't know it's it's like you're in your own little world i guess well, that's it. I mean, that's that's the being in the zone, right? That you're you're in the zone, and and it takes so much work mm -hmm. to get to that zone. But it also, from what you're talking about, it that confidence to be able to let go mm -hmm. as well, and let go of like the active mind, right? The active mm -hmm. mind is like, hey, Matt, you got to hit this. You got to hit a ten. You got to hit a ten. Don't hit an eight. Yeah. You're like, I hit an eight again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, I I wondered for a, a while there. I wondered is that something that like I taught myself recently or do you think that was something that I learned from birth? Because uh, I was born this way. So all my life people have been staring at me and and pointing and you know all that kind of stuff. And at a young age, I learned to block them out. I remember, you know, being eight years old and I heard a bunch of kids laughing and pointing and, and, and laughing at me. And I just did my own thing. I jumped on a bike and rode down the hill anyway. And I forgot about those kids laughing at me, you know, like, is that something that I have ingrained in me from growing up and learning how to just do my own thing and block people out? So now that I'm in archery and I'm in that moment, it's very natural for me to just be like, Shh and be that focused and not care what people think or say or and that is do me that's really interesting i mean i'd imagine it's probably something that you've been refining and and refining for this specific purpose as well but kind of cool when you look back on your life and go that was actually important that thing yeah. those kids laughing at me is something mm -hmm. that's helping me to potentially yep. be the best in the world at what mm -hmm. I do. Can we talk about a time when you actually were the best in the world, this, this world record? I mean, this is, <laughs> so can you describe, so, it, so it's 310 yards that you hit a target 310 yards. So Guinness Book of World Records, right? Mm -hmm. How did this, how did this all work? And how did you how did you cite it how did you figure out like yeah talk, talk us through the whole process what, what happened here so when i tell this story you're going to see a very similar uh you're going to see some similarities between what we just talked about and this world record so this this is kind of cool so the target was too far away i could see the general shape of it but I couldn't see any scoring rings. It just looked like a blob down there. And with the rules that they put in place, you have to use a, a low poundage bow. So I was actually aiming at a air conditioner unit at a building across the street. That's how <laughs> that's when you look, I mean, that that's what it took for the arrows to drop in there. Um, I you ready for this. This is crazy. So the rule state that you have to use a 60 pound bow, a feet of bow, which is what I shoot. And you only get three attempts. So that's a lot different than your, than your competition bow. Than your no, competition. it's the same. It's the same exact bow. When I say feet of that, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the uh, tournament stuff we shoot at for the Paralympics would be called feet of tournaments. Okay. Um, you only get three attempts to do it and you have to call your shot like you have to tell the guy that from guinness like i'm gonna hit a bullseye right now right like you can't just sit out there and shoot until you hit it and then be like hey i got the record like you have to be that good so the day before i shoot 72 arrows or something like that and i hit the target only like five times like i'm trying to sight in well then the next day when it was for real i shoot probably 25 arrows for warm-up and it's windy 
it takes like five seconds from an arrow to get there. So you shoot, you got to wait like five seconds to see if the arrow <laughs> even gets there or not. And so the camera people there, there's all these Michael Johnson's like there, like behind my back. And I know how awesome he is. And I'm like, I don't want to, you know, this guy's pretty awesome. I, he's the best runner in the world. And I don't want to embarrass myself, but I shoot like 30, 30 some arrows I shoot and I don't hit the target one time. I don't hit it at all. I'm like, I'm the wind is so bad that, that if you shoot an arrow and for three seconds of the arrow flight, there's no wind, then the wind picks up the last two seconds it's, at that distance, you know, you're off by a centimeter at the, where I'm at, you know, you're talking like feet at the target. Right. So at one point, um, the Guinness guy comes over and at 1130, I was supposed to make my first shot. That's what we advertised. And since I'm not hitting the target, um, one of the guys comes over and says, like, hey, man, you know, you can practice as much as you want. Like, we don't have to do this right at 1130. I'm like, no, nah, we're doing it at 1130. And 1130 comes around and I make my first shot and I miss. And I immediately look at the Guinness guy and say, I'm going again. And I, I nail it. And then I nail it again. I hit it two times in a row. In fact, if we had heart monitors on stuff and uh, one of the guys um, that his name is George, um, he's the one that put kind of like uh, help get all this around. And he had a heart monitor on too. And during my shot, his heart rate was like 160 beats per minute. Like his heart rate, like he was running a marathon and he was just standing there watching me. And they, so over the course of two days, I shoot, you know, a hundred arrows or whatever. And oh, where was your heart times. rate? His is at 160. What's your heart rate? I think mine was 105 or something like that. Or right. it was so it you was were like, in that was, zone. Yeah, you I were. was in that zone. So when it I even though I missed 30 times before, as soon as it was game time, boom, boom, boom. Like it's 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 the focus. Like apparently in the practice, I didn't have that focus, but now when it's for, for real. I was able to get myself in that mental game and it's like, look, man, you got to make this count. Like right now, you can't mess around. Like you got to make the best shot you can make. Is that who you are? That when the lights come on, it's like, okay, now I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'm very much, I'm very much that way. Like, I don't know if it's because you, you can go back to when I was younger and I've always been able to, I've always been able to just do it when it matters. I don't, and then I don't know. I think that's one of my gifts, I guess. That's the, the performer in you is like, okay, come on, everybody come watch. And then, yep. then with all the adrenaline going, you're able to like mellow out and focus, mm -hmm. and do what you need to do. Wow. Is that what brought you to car racing too? I mean, this is because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm watching videos about your car racing and about your cars and your your dual turbo and all these things <laughs> and stuff like that, right? I mean, you, you've got some crazy stuff going on. What was it like when you went in to get your license for the first time? Yeah, so to be honest, this is where the first time in life for me, I realized that life was not gonna be fair and I was gonna get judged based on what I looked like versus what I could accomplish. Uh, I was 16. I grew up on a farm, right? So I learned how to drive at like 12, driving tractors and trucks. And like, I knew how to drive. So at 16, I went in to get my, my I took a, uh, the driver's ed test or whatever. Yeah. I took my written tests, passed them, to, did a driving test, passed them. But then they actually wouldn't give me my permit. Um, the lady that was running the driver's ed said that she was afraid that if I was ever in an accident, that she would get sued because she was the one signing the paperwork saying that I was okay to drive. So she wouldn't actually like, even though I physically passed everything, she wouldn't issue me a permit and said, Nope, you got to go to the DOT in Iowa. And I had to wait till I was 18. They made me do physical therapy. They had me once a month, my mom would have to drive me like a hundred miles to this therapist guy who like would t test my reaction time and make me practice on the simulator. 
it was like this most it was dumb <laughs> uh it was it was one of those moments where i got fr- i got pretty frustrated with life because i'm like i just proved the, i just proved everyone that i could do it right like that doesn't make any sense to me and now because i have no arms it, it, they want me to have a modified car with the steering wheel on the ground and they want me to do all this extra stuff and they want like how's that fair and so I was pretty angry at those guys. Uh, when I turned 18, though, and I was able to get my driver's license, I had to pass my driver's test by four different DOT people. You know, like if you walk into a driver's license, usually you get one person sitting in the car and you go drive the car and they pass you. I had four people in the car and they all had to pass me in order for me to get my license. <clears throat> and it was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, watch this. <laughs> you know, like, you know what? I'm going to get this. And, and I was able to pass, um, and have my driver's license ever since. So that was it. But then, you know, not, not only, you're not just getting your driver's license to go to the supermarket or, you know, the corner store, you now, you, you, you drag race, mm-hmm. you, you jump cars, I mean, yeah. demolition derby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like a little bit of everything race on dirt, you know, so when, when did you decide, was this, was this, these four guys testing you going, okay. And you're like, all right, fine. I passed that. Now watch what I'm going to do. <laughs> Is that how that worked? K- kind of, you know, you, you're going to probably start to see, you see a trend here, but I gravitated toward cars because the cars don't stereotype the person that drives them. Like the cars don't care. The car doesn't care if you have arms or don't have arms, right? So I can get in a car that I made and I can go race somebody else and I can beat them and the car doesn't care. It's happy either way. Same way with archery. The bow doesn't care that I have arms or don't have arms. It just wants to be shot. And so that's why those two things work so well for me because I can go shoot my bow and do what I would like. And I'm not being told you can't do this. You can't do that. The bow's not saying you can't do that. You have no arms. The car's the same way. I can go enjoy my life and spend time with cars. And the car's not like, you can't do that. You have no arms. The car doesn't, the car's letting me do what I want to do and live life to its fullest. So, and I've always been, I've always been a, kind of addicted to adrenaline and, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I always tell people I would be a car racer full time if I could get paid to do it. <laughs> well, if you could, yeah, get paid to do it and afford to do it, right? I mean, it's yeah, not, yeah, it's exactly. Not it, it, it's not cheap at all. So, so your cars, I mean, because your cars are basically standard, right? I mean, just like, yeah, I mean, they're stripped. I mean, they're, well, they're not the race cars in a lot of ways. Right? It, <laughs> they're, they're race cars, but they're not modified for me. Like you could get in and drive the car just fine. Like right. it, it, yeah. yeah what's so when i was watching this is this is the question that came up to me because i'm watching you know you've got your your right leg up at basically you know you're you're like three o'clock two o'clock three o'clock kind of thing on the steering wheel with your with your right foot Mm -hmm. and you're sitting there but you're going fast you have to go around turns what's the balance like i mean that's the that's the thing that I looked at and went, okay, are, are you kind of like a weeble in there? How, how does this work? <laughs> See, seat belts are good things. Seat belts, you can you can lock yourself in pretty pretty solid and and, and trust that it's gonna hold you in place as you go around corners. So this jump. is your 16 point kind of seat belt thing. Yeah, it, it's locked, it's locked me in good. Like I am I'm not getting out of that. So at that point, I'm just the rag doll that gets thrown around and <laughs> and <laughs> now I enjoy the corners and the ramps because you're going fast you have a car that goes 200 miles an hour right it, yeah yeah and i mean last year or the year before i actually did a ride with with a nascar you know in a, in a nascar uh-huh. out in phoenix i did a ride along you know and of course i got into the car with the with the driver who's one of the like old guys who's on the track mm-hmm. and, and i looked at him i'm like so uh your job is to scare me, right? And he's like, uh-huh, that's my job. <laughs> and I was holding on for dear life. Like I was just getting sucked into the door mm-hmm. the whole time. I mean, that's, 
that there are some serious G's that are going on when you're when you're racing. That's that for you. I mean, I'd imagine it's an issue, but it's not an issue that that is insurmountable. Right. <clears throat> the best thing you can do is just relax your body, really. If you fight the G's, your neck's going to be sore. You're going to, you just got to relax and just let your body kind of float over here and float over there. And, and, you know, as long as you keep your eyes pointed on where you're wanting to go in the direction you want to go, you're going to, you're going to follow it. Even if you're sucked way over. We're, we're approaching the end of our time, Matt, but I want to, you, you mentioned some things when you're talking about, talking about your focus when you were when you were uh, shooting that that some of it you're attributing to those little kids laughing at you and taking that and and pointing it into something that's really good and and is beneficial and potentially i mean i'm on your side here like hoping that it, that it makes you the best in the world are there other things that you have like other adaptations because you said you're in an able-bodied world you're not changing what's going on but you have to change yourself and you have to adapt in order to make things work are there adaptations that have then you know given you an advantage um in in the archery world i would i would say there's nothing that has given me advantage except of the mental state that i have like i like for example let's Let's take uh, an able body archer for a second. Let's put them in a gold medal match against me with 10,000 people watching. Those guys, ha I mean, they haven't experienced the, that before. And you know what I'm saying? Like my whole life, like we talked about with the kids, right? Like my whole life, I've, I've had attention to myself. Not, I don't want it, but because I have no arms, every, I get the attention anyway. And I'm able to block it out. Well, let's just pretend now we're just throwing you into a big group of, you know, 10,000 people all of a sudden, and now you need to perform. Well, they've never had that before. So I have that advantage where I've been there my whole life. I've, I've had that. And, and so that's where I would think my advantages come from. What about on the physical side? Is there anything like with, with actually using mm. your leg, which is less, less dexterous, potentially, though you do have the, the baseball size development in your in your head for, for using your feet uh but but does does that benefit you is that one of those things where your legs might be stronger than somebody's arms and and can benefit you or or not or uh i don't know i mean it just seems like one of those questions that somebody might ask so that's a good point it's been brought up before there is an advantage when it comes to i use bigger muscles I can aim my bow for a longer period of time. I can pull more weight than the average person. So like my bow, when I, it's 60 pounds. So when I draw the bow back, I'm pulling 60 pounds where, and that's the maximum amount they allow. And that's because I use my leg. Well, most of my competitors might be running 50 pounds, 52 pounds, somewhere in there, because they can't, they can't draw 60 pounds for, you know, days on end and, and not get worn out. Uh, so there is an Physically, there would be a little bit of an advantage on that aspect of things. Um, the bigger the muscles, the more poundage. I, I can aim for like a minute without being tired. Well, the average person gets about 10 seconds of aiming and they're like, we got to get this shot gone. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so if you look at it that way, I would definitely say there's a little bit of an advantage. But I'm capitalizing on that one. <laughs> Well, take advantage of that too, because yeah, I'd imagine people go, okay, the they're, they're might they're bigger muscles, but then when you first started shooting a bow, I would imagine somebody looked at you and went, "So you're planning to shoot this with your foot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How is that going to work?" This is the timeline. When I said I'm going to shoot a bow, people are like, "There's no way. You have no arms. You can't shoot a bow." but I, sh I taught myself how to shoot. Well, then they were like, whoa, you see the guy without arms shooting? That's, that's pretty good. Then I, then I started winning and they're like, uh, okay, wait a minute. Maybe it's not quite fair on how he shoots his bow. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like, wait a minute. Like a couple of years ago, you're like, there's, 
you were like just amazed that I could shoot a bow. Now you're saying it's unfair. Like, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> Uh, I, listen i'm not even joking i shot a tournament in 2017 and i shot the uh outdoor nationals uh, which is the mandatory tournament to make you know the the team you or not team usa but uh the usa archery team and i shot able body that year and it was really windy and i actually ended up winning the whole event by like 20 points and there was guys who complained, who filed complaints saying that it was unfair that I shot in their division because I was sitting in a chair, which was lower to the ground, and they thought somehow I was shooting under the wind. And I, I'm like, wind is wind. Like I, I got, I was like, obviously, I was like, the judge just took their money, put it in his pocket, and probably used that money to buy a burger later. Like it. It was the most ridiculous thing that anyone's ever protested me about. And and I'm only like maybe a foot lower in my chair than they are. If they're standing beside me, I'm like waist level. So I'm like not that much difference. And and we're all in the same row. It, it is what it is. I laugh about it. I'm like, well, look, I mean, there's no rules that say you can't sit in a chair. So you guys want to sit in a chair, sit in a chair. <laughs> it is interesting Matt because you get it you kind of get it from both sides right you get those mm -hmm. little kids when you're eight years old then you get the people who are saying no no this guy with no arms is beating up on me like like you know yeah. somebody <laughs> needs to fix this this guy shouldn't be doing this which is yeah which has to be the greatest compliment in a lot that you can receive right it feels it feels amazing uh when I got into the sport there was there's a, like a handful of guys who, in my opinion, were the best in the world. And those are the guys I was chasing. Those are the guys I beat that day. And one of those guys is the one that can file the complaint against me. So like, I'm like, you know what? That's amazing. Like I, I was such on, I was such on a high because I was like, I'm in their heads now. Like, <laughs> you know, like my, my idols, when I, you know, those idols guys that I looked up to when I first started that I wanted to be like, like, now they're worried about me. <laughs> Which is great. You can offer them advice, you know, go figure out how yeah. to do it better. And then, then yeah, we'll yeah. Again. Like, <laughs> you know, I, there's so many things that I could say, but at the end of the day, I just, I just laugh and I ignore them, you know, because I'm just there to do my thing and what I can control. And if they're worried about me, and shooting under the wind then they clearly aren't there focused on what they were supposed to be focused on matt that sounds like exactly where we need to stop because that is that is the the nugget that we're looking for right that all you can do is focus on what you can focus on and we wish you the best of luck in tokyo i will i will definitely be watching and cheering uh thanks for joining us this has been a pleasure it's always a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you Thank you so much for having me. And I will be listening for your claps. <laughs> yes. Yes, you will. My claps will be coming from Stanford, Connecticut. So, so I'll, be a, I'll be as loud as I can. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I message you when I hear him. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Thank you to all of you for listening. Uh, you know, the greatest compliment that you can pay us is to tell your friends. You know, if you've liked what you've heard today, here, here, please tell your friends. Please like us. Please subscribe. We're on YouTube, we're on, we're on Apple, we're on Spotify. Please follow us, please like us, and please join in for another one. We'll have, I can't say that, every, that everybody's going to be, uh, you know, that, that, that anybody will be as good as Matt, but, you know, I hope that we will, you know, so that's exactly what we're looking for. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. Best of luck. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe to Chris Waddell Living It for more stories on the adaptive community, the Paralympics, artists, athletes, entrepreneurs, experts in the experience of being human. Also follow us on Spotify, Apple, Facebook, and Instagram. I look forward to seeing you next week.